Next up, if I can find the page in my notes, uh, Yu Kai Chao. He is uh, the originator of the Octalysis framework. Uh, Phil spoke about it earlier. We've been hinting at it all day that you know, understanding the core intrinsic motivations of users is incredibly powerful. And it's been called a, a gamification framework, and there's aspects to it that are. But if gamification, if the idea of gamification turns you off, it really is like 100 times deeper than that. And he travels around the world speaking to governments, to massive corporations. And uh, I, I think so much of what he's going to share today kind of applies broadly across so many of the topics. So with that, Yukai, I'd uh, love for you to give your talk. Thanks for having me. Let's see if our slides come out great. <clears throat> so great, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm Yukai Chow. Uh, pleasure to be here. I used to be based in the Bay Area for about 15 years, but during COVID, I moved to Taiwan, and it was really nice there, so I stayed there. So, uh, but always nice to be back. Today, I'm going to talk about the Octalysis framework, a framework about gamification and behavioral design. And a quick background myself, I uh, started my journey in gamification since 2003, so about 21 years now. And I was rated the number one gamification guru in the world three out of four years. One year as number two, and later they made me a judge, so I got disqualified, unfortunately. Um, but my design work uh, has impacted over 1.5 billion users around the world. Uh, wrote a book, Actionable Gamification, sold 100,000 copies, uh, whatnot. And uh, these are some of the companies uh, I've worked with, either our workshop or we design, we do consulting for them. Uh, this is the book I wrote, Actionable Gamification. I think we were supposed to have a, a copy for every person here that I could sign, but there were some logistical issues, apparently. So, um, but anyway, if today's talk was interesting, uh, or is interesting, you can go uh, check it out. And I'm uh, not going to go through the quotes, but you could say that, see that uh, VP at Google, partner at IDEO, co-founder Ethereum all have pretty good things to say about uh, working with me and the things that you're going to see today. And then connected to a subscription model, I also have a gamified island platform to learn about gamification design. And we have a daily active user of a monthly active user of 38%, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what we do on this platform called Octalysis Prime 2. So this is the Octalysis framework, and this is what we're most known for. It's a combination between the word octagon and analysis. And inside, there's what we call the eight core drives that motivate all our behavior. And then outside, there's an example list, not exhaustive list, of a variety of game design techniques and strategies that could bring out these eight core drives. Now, this chart is pretty busy. So at the beginning, we usually just focus on the center. And what's unique about these eight core drives is that everything we do in life is based on one or more of these eight core drives, which means that if there's none of these eight core drives there, there's zero motivation. No behavior happens. Every one of you are here because of at least one of these eight core drives, probably very similar to a uh, similar profile for the audience here. But some people are here because of core drive seven, unpredictability and curiosity. Hey, I'm just curious, what is this conference going to be about? What is this talk going to be about? Some people are here because of core drive five, social influence and relatedness. Hey, you know, a friend told me about it, a colleague invited me, so I show up. Some people are here because of core drive two, development and accomplishment. Hey, I really want to learn new skills, level up, and do my work better. Occasionally, we have people in the room that's motivated by core drive one, epic meaning and calling. What I'm learning here is really going to change the world, and it's where the future is going to be at, so I want to be part of it. Uh, when I do uh, the speaker events at different countries, you have uh, core drive six, scarcity and impatience. Hey, the speaker only comes to my country you know, once every year, so let me reprioritize my schedule and do it. And then when I do private corporate workshops, uh, some people are here just because of core drive eight, loss and avoidance. Like, oh, I don't want to lose my job, so I show up. Uh, hopefully that's not many of you, or not the only reason. But the key thing is without these eight core drives, nothing happens. People don't even eat. So the quick way to use this, this framework is just to think about what is the desired behavior you want, and what among these eight core drives are motivating them? Because if it's not, they're not doing it, and then brainstorm what uh, you can do with these eight core drives to bring that out even more. So we're going to go through what these eight core drives are. We're going to go through some examples. And uh, then we're going to talk about different natures of those core drives. Some are what we call white hat motivation core drives. It makes people feel powerful and control. 
but they lack urgency, they procrastinate. And then there's what we call black hat motivation core drives. It gives people a higher sense of urgency, uh, sometimes obsession, but they also feel like they're not in control of their own behavior, so they could burn out. And then we're gonna explore what are the ex intrinsic motivation core drives and extrinsic motivation core drives. Uh, when I first created this framework in 2012, I didn't have any ambitious academia. I just wanted to create some tool to solve some problems. Uh, but now if you go on, go on Google Scholar and you search for octalysis, you'll see over 3,000 PhD theses, academic journals, referencing the framework. So again, just very, very blessed and lucky that something I just came up out of my intellectual curiosity became something that not only stands strong in the commercial world, but the, the, uh, the uh, academic world. So the first core drive is epic meaning and calling. This is saying that we feel motivated because we feel like we're part of something bigger than ourselves. And this is why, for instance, people contribute to Wikipedia. We, do, we all know people don't contribute to Wikipedia because they can make money, but they also don't do it to update their resumes, advance their careers, right? A lot of people spend a few hours every day after work updating Wikipedia because they believe they're protecting humanity's knowledge, something bigger than themselves. And in the game, you often see this theme. The game will say, hey, the world's about to end, but somehow you're the only person qualified to save the world. And it feels very engaging, very motivating. A lot of people do it. So this core drive ties to higher level themes like sustainability, like honor, patriotism, uh, faith. It's used a lot these days in politics. And a lot of it's based on storytelling, but there's some mechanics to uh, deal with that. So one example is a client we have called uh, Full Dive. There are a, a mobile browser, and it's basically when you browse through their app, they'll give you cryptocurrency rewards, et cetera, et cetera. The problem with these kind of apps is that a lot of times the economy, the reward economy is not so great. People will be doing things for a long time and they feel like, wow, I'm just getting like $4 from a bunch of effort. So they kind of burn out from that. So we added a bit of epic meaning and calling to them. So what we did is we said, hey, instead of giving, getting a $5 Amazon gift card, you can actually donate it so 20 kids don't have to starve tonight. You know, and so people feel, wow, because I'm using the app, I feel like a humanity hero. I'm actually making a difference for the world, and it makes them want to come back and use the app more, and they don't feel like they're wasting their time browsing the internet. So this is a straight quote from the CEO that says, after working with us, uh, of course, we did a few more other things, but Epic Meaning and Calling was a key theme. Uh, the App Store rating went from 4.1 to 4.7 stars. Um, the downloads went from 600K to 2.7 million, and most importantly, their uh, weekly retention went up from 12% to 29%, so more than double because people feel great when they're using the app. Core drive two is development accomplishment. So this basically says because we feel like we're improving ourselves, leveling up, achieving mastery, we feel very, very driven. Now, most of the points and badges you see in gamification fall into this core drive. Points are just mathematical counters. It shows it's a progression, right? So even though you're doing the same things over and over and over again, at least you see this number getting bigger and bigger, this progress bar growing longer and longer, so you feel like you're getting somewhere. For some people, that's like their work. You know, oh, my job every day, I'm doing the same thing again and again and again. But at least they see my bank account growing bigger and bigger, and that makes me feel happy. Now, badges are what we call achievement symbols. They symbolize a sense of accomplishment. And achievement symbols can be many different forms. It could be badges, trophies, uniform changes, white belt, black belt, and martial art. Of course, that became a quality management Six Sigma. But the key thing is that it must symbolize an accomplishment. If you give people a badge for every silly thing they do, then it's just an icon, right? It has no meaning. You have to build the experience so that when people get a badge, they're so proud of it, they want to tell other people about it, they want to show off. And obviously, Duolingo is a huge theme in, uh, in this uh, conference. So Duolingo is one of the most famous gamified examples in language learning. And you can see there's a variety of game design techniques they use. And 70% of that list really fall into that core drive to development accomplishment. You give them status points, you're growing, there's progress bars, you get a streak design, you have a badge, there are celebrated Wednesday moments with the high fives and the crowning. A lot of these things all fall into making people feel great at every step and say, hey, I feel I'm learning, I'm being more accomplished, I'm getting there. And so as a result, Duolingo obviously very, very successful. Um, 500 million users, 74 million monthly active users with uh, 5.2 million paid subscribers. Very, very strong. And as we know, online learning, most people sign up at the beginning. They have some motivation, but they just drop out. So the, the gamification keeps people motivated and driven. <laughs> Core drive three is empowerment of creativity and feedback. So that's, so that's kind of like Lego. You give users the basic building blocks, 
and there's an infinite amount of ways for them to utilize their creativity, try different strategies, see feedback, and then go back and adjust. And that's a very engaging uh, experience. By the way, I'm talking really fast because I have a lot to cover. I'm really passionate about this stuff. Um, so this is everything that deals with things like self-expression, uh, creativity, meaningful choices, um, you know, autonomy. And you'll see later that it's on the right top of the octagon, which means it's a white hat intrinsic right brain motivation core drive, which means that it's the longest lasting type of motivation. All the timeless games in the world have this core drive. Doesn't matter if it's chess, poker, or mahjong, whatnot. Um, so if you look at a game like chess, chess is a pretty straightforward game. There's 64 squares, 32 pieces that people have been playing for centuries, right? Chess doesn't have to be like every week, oh, here's a new piece, here's a new map, here's a new board, a new hero enters the game, right? They don't have to keep adding content because our brains are entertaining itself. It's like being an inventor or a scientist, lifelong experimentation, always engaging. So this is actually a, a project we, we designed for Porsche. It's a gamified loyalty program. And uh, it looks kind of like a futuristic racing game, but in order to play this game, you must first own a Porsche. And uh, we launched this in Austria. So and based on how you drive your Porsche and how you interact with other Porsche drivers that are near you, you will get a variety of perks and benefits and status, and you can customize your futuristic car even better. So you, you're, you're having some self-expression with status. And the goal is for Porsche, the car company, to have constant interaction with their customers, because most of the time, you know, the, the consumers, they only have interactions with the dealership, with the car maintenance people, some online forums, and the actual car manufacturer, they don't have a lot of ways to reach the individual and upsell their cars. And so <clears throat> what we saw was that users spent 5.5 minutes in the app every single day while they were not allowed to, uh, well, they were not allowed to use it while they're driving. So they drive, they stop, and they start going to the app, and they see what they've gotten and whatnot. So based on this, what they can do is get free perks in terms of uh, some donuts or coffee. But the most important thing is that it allows them to upgrade to their next car more easily because they want you to buy a more expensive Porsche. And the actual client, the Volkswagen family, they also own Bentley and Bugatti. So they're trying to tie user engagement into a higher uh, purchase. Core Drive 4 is ownership and possession. So this is the drive that says, because we feel like we own something, we want to prove it, we want to protect it, and we want to get more of it. So this is like virtual goods and virtual currencies. It's the drive that makes us want to collect stamps and baseball cards. And there's also this more abstract concept of if we invest a lot of our time to customize our LinkedIn profile, Dropbox folders, or the systems learning about us and, and giving us uh, recommendations or personalized experiences, we feel more attachment hence ownership with that experience. So even if a new product that comes out that's supposed to be better, more high tech, we don't want to switch because that one doesn't understand me, this one does, this one's my system. And so when we look at Strava, Strava is something that's very powerful in the sense that we all know that you know, exercise is good for us, but our brains don't like to process long-term benefits. We like short-term gratification. And so we want to see how we're growing, how we're improving our lives, and how our health is getting better and better. So it starts to keep track of your growth, your health. And because it gives a lot of great feedback mechanics and win states, uh, we have 120 million users um, with two, two, 10 billion exercise activities, um, which uh, turns out to be 40 million every single week. So very, very strong. And people are constantly engaged because they can see how their lives are improving uh, in that. Core Drive 5 is social influence and relatedness. So this is everything you do based on what other people do, think, or say. So this deals with things like collaboration, competition, uh, gifting, group quests. It also has the relatedness piece, which deals with things like nostalgia. Like if you see a product that reminds you of a childhood, you have a higher chance of buying the product. If you meet someone from the same hometown, you have a higher chance of striking a deal with that person. And a lot of times what we see this play out is in, in a friend quest, or group quest is what we call the dynamic. So Duolingo also goes very hard on this group quest uh, game mechanic, and they have this function of a friend quest where you get to invite your friends to, to learn together, you build a streak together, and you can, you can nudge them a lot, you can, and you see it leads to your treasure chest. 
And so they want people, if the app is constantly saying, hey, come back, come back, we miss you, come back, it's not as powerful. Some people feel like it's annoying. Well, Duolingo also does that with the owl, so it's, and they make it kind of cute and funny. Uh, but they also use other people to trigger in, and most people are not upset about that. So, and they'll use like a skull that says, audacity of letting our streak die, right? So it really pushes people to want to come back. And it's okay because my friend is trying to have us win together. So you don't really think that someone's trying to push you to do something you don't want to do. You already want to learn, which is why you signed up in the very beginning. But sometimes you lack motivation, you get distracted, and your friend is there to push you. And so uh, the key is allowing a lot of triggers for people to push you very easily. Core drive six is scarcity and impatience. So this basically says we want something because we can't have it or it's very difficult to obtain. And so this is something, for instance, Facebook used uh, when it first started, right? At the beginning, Facebook said, the Facebook.com is only for Harvard students. If you don't go to Harvard University, too bad, you can't use Facebook. And then it says, well, you know, it's open for Harvard and some Ivy League schools and some other schools that your high school buddies got in, but you didn't get in, too bad. So then it opened up to more and more schools. So when it opened up to uh, UCLA in 2004 when I was attending it, everyone rushed into Facebook. Not because they already knew how great Facebook was, right? Because no one has ever used it, but that sheer exclusivity alone made people want to join. You're not allowed to do it? Okay, now you're allowed to do it, and everyone wants to go in. And they obviously replicated that model in every single university, then in all the high schools, then in all, you know, the whole entire population. So that idea of saying, we don't allow you to do something, that creates desire. It also connects to referral programs. So a lot of people, uh, a lot of apps will say, hey, tell, tell your friends about this. And people are like, you know, why should I? I know it's good for you, but how is it good for me, right? Are you going to pay me money for it? But then there are apps that say, hey, you're only allowed to invite three friends. You have three exclusive invites. And suddenly these people are going around their social media and say, hey, who's one of my buddies who wants my three exclusive invites? to you know, Clubhouse or Gmail or what have you, right? So when you say do it a thousand times, they don't care, they do zero times. But if you say you're only allowed to do this three times, then they actually go out and do this three times. So people want to challenge what they can't have. If you set a limit, if you say you can sign up anytime you want, they don't care. If you say you can only sign up in the next 10 minutes, they want to sign up in the next 10 minutes. So this goes to something we call anchor juxtaposition which is basically putting things side by side, basically paying money or grinding for value, okay? So Dropbox did that in its early days. When you, when you start uh, using Dropboxes, yeah, you have some free space. And uh, people will say, yeah, let me just you know, get this free space and say, hey, if you invite some friends, if you do this, if you follow us on Twitter, you'll get 250 more megabytes. So at the beginning, most people will just do the grinding because by principle, they don't want to pay, right? But then they, at one point, they realized, wow, you know, I need to do all of this, invite 30 more friends, 50 more friends. This is a lot of work. So they end up uh, doing the grinding for a bit, either upload photos or following and inviting their friends, and then they end up paying. But the key thing is they need to be put side by side. If you just say, hey, do these activities, invite your friends, people will be like, well, I don't care. Why should I do that? But if you just say, hey, pay us or go away, a lot of people might say, well, I'm never going to pay these greedy bastards, and they leave, right? So when you put them side by side, oftentimes they'll look at the price and they'll go do the grinding. And it's, it's crazy how much work people will do to not pay like $10. And they're willing to spend 3, 5, 10, 15, 20 hours doing all this stuff. At one point, they finally realize, wait a second, my time is worth money, right? Why, why should I spend 30 hours just avoiding a $10 fee? And so they end up doing both, right? They first grind and then they pay because of the scarcity mechanic. Core drive seven is unpredictability and curiosity. So this is basically, uh, you because you don't know what's gonna happen next, you're always thinking about it. So this is heavily utilized in the gambling industry, but whenever you have a sweepstakes program, a lottery system, a raffle ticket system, uh, you have this core drive, this is also why you see a lot of apps, what they do is the loading screen or some search engine you, you, you turn on, they always show some random uh, imagery, right, or inspirational quote. They want the brain to think, okay, what's gonna happen next? I want this anticipation. Of course, it's also the drive that makes us wanna finish a book or a movie, which is why uh, we don't want to uh, see a lot of spoilers before we're ready for it. And so, remember I said that I had a, a, a platform myself called Octalysis Prime, and this is also a subscription model. And so people come in every single day, 
and the first thing they do is they open a daily chess, right? So, and the daily chess could give you somewhere between 80 to 130, 130 chow coins. And we do 80 be to 130 because we want to make people feel like 100 is the mid mid middle point. So if you're more than 100, you feel lucky. But we make it more often that you feel lucky. But more importantly, there's a 40% chance every uh, twice, every 12 hours when you get on that there's going to be a little bit, uh, there's something's going to be a little bit different. A little new creature's going to appear. And in this case, there's a little thing on the top. You go into the section and you see this little blue wolf. It's always a different animal. And then it'll ask you a gamification question. Again, this whole island is about uh, people learning about gamification design. So if you get it right, it'll go into your uh, Geomon album and you'll collect it. But if you get it wrong, it will run away and you'll lose it. So I remember we had a member who, uh, who encountered a, a mystical Geomon, which is a 1% chance of showing up, the leprechaun. And he got the question incorrect. So the leprechaun ran away, and it scarred him for years, okay? He's like, I must watch all these videos, learn all the gamecation. I never want this to happen again. And after that, he, he, picked, he uh, captured many more mystical geomonts, even legendary ones, which I think is a 0.2% of showing up. But he still remembers that first one that, that, uh, that got lost. So like I said earlier, we have a DAU over MAU of 38%, which roughly means that if you, people care a little bit, they come in once a month. 38% of them are coming every single day. Uh, and we have a course completion rate of over 60%. Most companies out there is between 1% to 5%. And uh, I remember there was a member who came to me and said, hey, Yukai, uh, I think the leveling system is broken. I'm like, okay, yeah, tell me why. And she's like, oh, because I, f I'm like a, I think I'm leveling too quickly. You know, I'm, I'm already silver status, and I'm not even one of those hardcore players. I'm like, okay, let, tell me about it. Uh, when did you sign up to Octalysis Prime? And she said, oh, about 15 or 16 months ago. And I said, all right, then how often do you come onto this platform? And she's like, uh, well, at least I'll come on every day to open the chest, cap the Geomon, and after that I might do this. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. So you've been telling me that you're on octalysisprime.com every single day without fail for 16 months straight. She's like, yeah, it's about right. I said, and you still think you're leveling too quickly. And uh, so for those of you who don't know, there's like so blue status, uh, orange, purple, silver, gold, and black. So she's like silver. So she's four out of six. So I'm like, yeah, I think you're pretty good. You're, uh, this is where you're at. It's not broken. But if you can see in the background, there's the leaderboard, right? At max, you can capture two Geomons a day, 40% every 12 hours, right? The, that's the leaderboard in the back. The number one user has 1,700 uh, Geomons. So this, this guy's just insane. And uh, number seven is 1,200. So, so that's like at least 600 days in a row. So, uh, so very strong engagement because of that unpredictability. Every day they come back. If they know exactly what they're going to capture, they don't care. The brain needs to have that anticipation. And it's very important because some apps, what they do is they come in, they make you do a lot of things, and then there's the unpredictable, the, the treasure box or these unpredictable things. The brain then associates the, the uh, unpredictable event to doing a bunch of things. So you procrastinate. You want to connect the unpredictable surprise event, the surprise delight, to the act of coming back to the platform. When they come back, they feel surprised, which means their brain thinks, oh, yeah, I want to come back more often because I want to find out what happens next. Core drive eight is loss and avoidance. This is straightforward. You're doing something to avoid a loss. You don't want something bad to happen. It's the fear core drive and, uh, you know, or, or fear of missing out sometimes, FOMO. And this is the uh, Forest app. I actually know the founder is based in Taiwan. And it's a productivity app where you say, I'm going to concentrate for 25 minutes. And you set the countdown timer. Once, it, uh, once the countdown timer goes off, it plants the tree into your forest. But there's a little trick to it. If you get distracted and start playing with your phone, your tree will die. And it's not just going to say, oh, you failed, too bad, you got distracted. It's going to plant your dead tree into your forest. And you'll have to stare at that failure for a whole year. So people are like, oh, no, I don't want to have to go back and concentrate. I don't want to, to stare failure in the face all, all year long. So this app, uh, they had 40 million downloads. And uh, 6 million are paying, which is a very high ratio from uh, downloads to pay, as you might know. Just from download to, to day two, you know, a third or half of the user base oftentimes just drop out, so let alone paying users. Also, uh, in Duolingo, you, it's, very, it's a big thing about the streak. Um, the key thing about it is that most people think streak designs are about development accomplishment. Hey, 10 in a row, 100 in a row. 
but almost inevitably, it becomes core driver eight loss and avoidance. People are just scared to lose their streak. They're afraid to go on long flights because they might lose, lose it and, and they can burn out. So that's why there's a lot of designs to say, hey, how you can save your streak and bring it back, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes there is a feeling of achievement. So one of my Octalis Prime members was sharing, sharing this where he had 1,500 uh, day streaks in a row and everyone was impressed, right? Remember we said achievement symbols, it needs to be something so amazing people wanna brag about it. And so this, I was impressed, so that's why I wanted to share it here too. And so it's very powerful. All right, so these are the eight core drives that motivate all our behavior. Again, without these eight core drives, no behavior happens, no motivation. But it's also graphed in the octagon shape for a reason. The left side, we call them left brain core drives. It doesn't necessarily mean it's geographically on the left versus right but it symbolically represents the logical brain versus the emotional brain. And since this, this is a design tool, I kind of like it. Left side, left brain, right side, right brain. But what's actionable about it is that the left brain core drives deal with extrinsic motivation, things you do for a reward, a purpose, or a goal, but you don't necessarily enjoy the activity itself. So once you obtain the reward, or you hit your goals, or you get used to the reward, it becomes stale, you stop doing the behavior. Whereas the, and this is usually good for attracting people into the system, right? You have to justify it, hey, even you're busy, if you sign up, you can get a free iPad or whatever, or you get a diploma, you get a certificate. These are all extrinsic motivation. Whereas the right brain core drives deal with intrinsic motivation. These are things that we enjoy doing to the point that we're even willing to spend money just to experience it. And even if we lost all that progress the next day, we lose our points, badges, certificates, NFTs, we would still wanna do this activity today because that's how we measure our quality of life, right? How much time we just spend on things we enjoy doing. So we don't need a reward to enjoy using our creativity. We don't need a reward to hang out with our friends. And we actually don't need a reward to enjoy being this uh, suspense of unpredictability. Um, in fact, here's an example. If you sit there and you press a button for four hours straight and you're guaranteed a paycheck, that's kind of boring, right? That's like a job at a factory. Most people don't like that. But if you sit there and you press a button for four hours straight, and maybe you'll get a paycheck, maybe you won't, maybe you'll even lose money. Suddenly that's casino gambling, and a lot of people like that, <laughs> right? Same behavior, one you're guaranteed a payout, and the other one you're most likely gonna lose money, that's how the casinos make so much money. But our brains prefer the latter because we're literally paying for that entertainment, that thrill of, hey, maybe I'll win. And that's why I'll have friends who tell me, hey, Yukai, just came out of the casino, lost $200, but that was so much fun, let's go back next week. Right? They're paying for their entertainment, it's intrinsic. Now, intrinsic motivation obviously is good for keeping people in the ecosystem for as long as possible. They don't want it to end. They don't want to cheat to get the rewards. They don't want to be like, hey, I got my free stuff, so I'm gonna be gone. They just want it to last forever. Now, most companies like to design for left brain core drives, extrinsic motivation, but it's not necessarily better, it's just easier, right? If you want people to do something, you just give them a badge, a level, some money, some certificates, as opposed to making the activity fun. The problem is that a lot of times, if you overly rely on extrinsic motivation, people forget uh, the intrinsic motivation. So if, they're, if they were doing it anyway, because they enjoy it, once you start giving them rewards, and then you say, all right, no more rewards, they just burn out, they don't wanna do it anymore. It's called the over-justification effect. Now, there's also a difference between top and bottom. Top ones, we call them white hat motivation core drives. So if you're doing something because you're uh, connecting some, a higher, uh, more meaningful thing, you're improving yourself, achieving mastery, and you're also using your creativity, it feels very, very good. The problem is that there's, you procrastinate because there's no urgency, you're in full control. If you do it, you feel happy, but a lot of times you don't do it. What we end up doing are the black hat activities, and those are things where you're just avoiding a loss, right? You just uh, can't have something, or you don't know what's gonna happen next. And even though there's more urgency, um, because people feel like they're not in control of their own behavior, they can burn out more. So again, white hat motivation makes people feel powerful, in control, they feel good, but there's no sense of urgency. Black hat motivation makes people feel urgent, obsessed, sometimes even addicted, but they could burn out. And so, the reason why black hat motivation drives urgency is because it's tied more to our survival instincts, right? Avoiding danger, going after uh, scarce resources, or exploring new lands. And that's why we feel like we're compelled to do it, right? Because it's more connected to survival. Now, so white hat motivation is good for long-term things. Community management, loyalty programs, uh, creative workspaces, 
whereas Black Hat motivation is good for one-time transactions. Right? You just want people to give you money or sign up to the subscription or donate or short bursts of activities. So, but this leads to something I call the data illusion, and um, this is something that's pioneered actually by Zynga, which is this concept of data-driven design, right? which is a big trend. I think it's very good and sophisticated. And so Zynga is saying like, hey, no, we don't, we don't know the answer, so we're just gonna look at the data, and whatever works, we're gonna do more of that. Right? But the problem is that because black hat motivation drives urgency, whenever you pay too close attention to data, you're always gonna be more black hat. Like, hey, look, we put a torture break on, which is a thing that says, stop, you have to wait 10, 10 minutes before you can do more. Stop, you have to do 10 minutes. Everyone's coming back 10 times a day. They're inviting their friends. They're paying us money. That's amazing. Let's keep doing more of that, right? And so we want to be able to look at the big scale and say, hey, how are people feeling about it? With even, an even more extreme example is this is why, for instance, dictators uh, love core drive eight loss and avoidance, right? They'll say, according to the data, if we threaten to kill people and their families, and we even do it sometimes to show we're serious, Everyone change their behavior. So we're all data scientists, right? So it means we should do this more and more and more. So they will see the numbers working for them, but as human beings, we intuitively understand that people are not happy in this ecosystem, right? If they can't escape the country, they will. Some people might want to even band together with epic meaning and calling and try to overthrow this tyrannical government. So I, so I think it's very important to, when you see the data, also understand that while people are doing the behavior, how do they feel about it? Is it urgent? Is, are they feel like rushed into it? Or do they actually feel open and, uh, and it's more long-term sustainable? But just because it's black hat doesn't mean it's necessarily bad because a lot of people put themselves in black hat motivation to eat healthily, go to the gym exercise, or learn something more. Uh, this is a funny example where it's an alarm clock where every time you press the snooze button, it destroys your money. <laughs> so you are waking up because of core drive a loss and avoidance. You don't want to lose money, so you wake up. But you're okay with this because it's a goal you want to accomplish, right? You want to get up. What people don't like is when marketers, uh, employers, governments, educators, parents use a lot of black hat gamification techniques to get people to buy things they don't need, to work overtime without proper compensation, and get manipulated. And a lot of people will still do the activity because this stuff is obsessive, but the moment they can escape, they will want to. Employees leave the company, customers buy from competitors, some children even run away from home when the parenting strategy is too black hat. But again, if it's something they already want to do, they're happy. That's why um, Duolingo uses a lot of black hat to guilt you, say, why aren't you coming back? I'm going to kidnap your kids and all that stuff. And it's like, that's OK, because it's like, I want to learn. Thank you, work, thank you for working so hard and pushing me hard to do it. You pay your gym trainers to call you a loser sometimes, too, right? You're pretty like, like, you're so weak, you're so weak. Oh, but later, you're like, hey, thank you so much for pushing me harder than I could ever, could, ever uh, do myself. So that's the eight, that's eight core drives of the Octalysis framework. Um, and once you understand how you want them to feel and how you want to motivate them, that's when you go to the outer layer and think about what game design techniques should I use. It could be points or badges or group quests or Easter eggs, but the key thing is that just because you have these game elements does not mean people have motivation, right? You could have badges, but people don't feel accomplished. You could have a bunch of social buttons and features, but people don't feel socially connected or appreciated. So the key thing is that a behavior happens and an app is successful when you bring out those eight core drives, not when you have these fancy game mechanics. Now, we're gonna go through really quickly where you can go with this framework. Um, so once you have that framework, you can start analyzing a lot, uh, different applications, like LinkedIn, very left brain oriented. It's extrinsic, your life, your career, so people feel like they have to create an account. But then, you know, it kind of sits there. You only use it because you need to get an extrinsic result, right? Find a job or an opportunity, recruit someone, and so there's not a lot of engagement. Forest, you can see that it's, it's very much left brain, white hat oriented. Uh, this is an education platform called Classcraft and Revolut. So you can start analyzing how different things are engaging. Is it white hat, black hat, intrinsic, extrinsic, and what is the ideal? Then you can kind of use that framework to understand the player journey. So we break down a user's journey into four phases. Discovery phase, what motivates them to sign up? Onboarding, how do they learn the rules and tools to play the game? Scaffolding, people come back once a day, once a week, once a month, or 10 times a day, whatever your design is. And what motivates them to do it? And the end game, which is how do you motivate your veterans, people who have been there for five years, 10 years, 20 years, and they've done everything there is to do, have you motivate them to uh, stay in the ecosystem and contribute? So for every phase, we think about what core drives motivate them forward. Remember, if there's no motivation, there's no core drive, 
they just drop out. They, go, they don't go to the next phase. So maybe people sign up because of curiosity, right? Core Drive 7, or because their friend invited them. Maybe they're onboarding. They, a lot of things they can't have is dangle there, hey, survive to day three, and you can unlock this, uh, this feature, right? And that's, that pushes them onboarding. But the key thing is we get to think about how, how motivation evolves. Once we know this pretty well, then we can push up another level to level three octalysis and think about how different player types um, are motivated with, through the player journey. So here's Richard Bartle's four player types, achievers, explorers, or explorers, socializers, and killers, because these people are motivated differently. But now we have a framework to kind of understand how different people are motivated at different stages. So as an achiever, maybe you want to sign up and onboarding looks good. But scaffolding, you lose motivation, so you drop out. Explorers, they're curious, so they sign up, but maybe onboarding is confusing, so they're gone. Socializers may not want to even join because there's no socializing features advertised. And then the killers, uh, as a random example, might be the people who go through discovery, onboarding, scaffolding, endgame. And the endgame, they're showing off to the newbies. So you get to understand how the journey goes. Uh, we have a five-step design process that, that applies those eight core drives. It started with the strategy dashboard. Again, this is just like um, almost like a teaser in terms of if, if you check out the book, you can be more advanced about all these things. We, learns, we can learn how to build uh, complex game loops. But uh, at the end of the day, today, I think just the key thing to remember is these eight core drives motivate all our behavior. Without the, uh, these eight, no behavior happens. So when you just brainstorm through these eight, on a behavior you want, you'll see more success and more engagement. So again, you can check out my book at uh, Actionable Gamification. Still have to figure out if this logistic thing can be worked out or not. And uh, check, feel free to check out Octalysis Prime. And if you like today's uh, presentation slides, you can go to uh, hitmeup.ai slash ukai. That's like uh, my AI assistant that, that uh, handles all my inbound. Thank you very much. <laughs>